You're probably watching this video because you received notice from the court that a contested hearing was set in your restraining order case. You may have questions about what a contested hearing is, what to expect when you go to court, how to stay safe when you have to see the person who was abusing you, and how to prove your case. In this video, we'll cover all those questions and more. Before we go any further, we need to clarify some basic legal terms we will be using throughout the video. First, you are called the petitioner because you applied for or petitioned for the restraining order. The person the restraining order is against is called the respondent because they have to respond to allegations in your petition. A contested hearing is the respondent's opportunity to object to your restraining order. At this hearing, both you and the respondent will be able to tell your side of the story to a judge, as well as call witnesses and present other evidence. At the end of the hearing, the judge will decide whether you get to keep your restraining order or not. You should wear nice, clean clothing to your hearing, something that you might wear to a job interview or to church. Avoid wearing shirts with text or images or anything else that would be distracting to a judge. Also avoid tank tops, shorts, and torn up jeans. On the day of your hearing, try to get to court 30 minutes early. You'll need to find parking, go through security, and you may want a few minutes to talk to your witnesses before the hearing. There will usually be a sheriff's deputy present in the courtroom. If a deputy isn't present in the courtroom, the court staff can call one of the other courthouse deputies to come to the room if it becomes necessary. You may call the court ahead of your hearing date and request or confirm that a deputy will be present. You may also wish to bring a domestic violence advocate, friends, or family members with you for support. When you are in the court, here are a few guidelines for how you should act. Don't chew gum. Remove your hat when you're in the courtroom. Always be polite and avoid interrupting anyone during the hearing. Try not to react or make faces while the respondent or the respondent's witnesses testify. When you speak to the judge, you should always stand and refer to him or her as your honor. Most importantly, always tell the truth. At the hearing, there will probably be a number of people in the courtroom. The judge and their staff will be present, as well as other people with restraining orders or other legal matters. You may have to sit through other hearings before your case gets called. When it's your turn to present your case, the judge will call your name and provide you with additional instructions. Then, the judge will give both you and the respondent an opportunity to testify, present evidence, and call witnesses if you have any. To keep your restraining order, you're going to need to prove three things. One that you and the respondent have the right kind of relationship. Two, that you were physically abused, threatened with physical abuse, or sexually abused by the respondent in the last six months. And three, that you are in imminent danger of further abuse, meaning it is likely that the respondent will abuse you again in the future. You can watch our video on an overview of Family Abuse Prevention Act restraining orders for more information on what you have to prove to get a restraining order. If you are trying to get temporary custody and parenting time of your children, You'll also need to present evidence about yours and the respondent's parenting abilities. This video will not cover custody and parenting time. For more information, you can watch our video on custody and parenting time. Because abuse often occurs in private, most of your evidence in your case will come from your testimony. Telling your story in court and talking about your abuse can be difficult. It may be helpful to practice your testimony with a supportive friend or a domestic violence advocate before you go to court. You may want to create a list of all the abuse you experienced in the last six months, as well as other serious incidents of abuse that occurred more than six months ago. At the hearing, you can refer to this list occasionally to keep yourself organized, but you should not read directly from it. Be sure to tell the judge about any times the respondent has hurt you or tried to hurt you, including hitting, punching, choking, pushing, slapping, shaking, or kicking you. If you feel comfortable talking about it, you should also tell the judge about any times the respondent forced you to have sex against your wishes. You should also tell the judge if the respondent has threatened to physically hurt you, either verbally or in writing, or has done anything else that makes you afraid they will hurt you again. 
For example, maybe the respondent has access to guns, has threatened to use them against you, and you are afraid they will carry out their threat. When you testify about each incident, you should include as many details as possible, including the date of the incident, location of the incident, description of what happened, whether you were injured or your property was damaged, whether a weapon was involved, whether your children were present, if the police were called, whether the respondent was arrested and charged with a crime, and how you felt after the incident of abuse. You may also want to ask friends, family members, neighbors, coworkers, or other people who have witnessed the abuse or seen your injuries or heard the respondent threaten you or who have other helpful information, including information about the children to testify on your behalf. Before your hearing, you may want to prepare a list of questions to ask your witnesses. For example, if a witness saw you right after an incident of abuse, you might ask the witness to describe your injuries or describe how you are acting, like if you seem scared or panicked. Many people try to use letters from witnesses as evidence in their case. This type of evidence is usually not allowed in court. This is why it's important to have your witnesses appear in person to testify on your behalf. After you and your witnesses finish testifying, the respondent or their attorney will have an opportunity to ask questions. This is called cross-examination. If you are being cross-examined, you should answer the respondent's questions as briefly and honestly as possible. If you do not understand the question or do not know the answer, simply say, I don't understand or I don't know. The respondent is not allowed to argue with you if they do not like your answer. Do not guess and do not answer questions with sarcasm or rudeness. In addition to the testimony of witnesses, you can also use photos, text messages, emails, video recordings, or medical records, and criminal convictions in order to help prove your case. You should bring three copies of any photos or documents you intend to use in court, one for yourself, one for the judge, and one for the respondent. If you have evidence on your phone, like photos or text messages, you should make an effort to get those printed before your hearing. If the respondent has been convicted of any violent crimes, drug crimes, or crimes regarding domestic violence, including harassment, you should make an effort to get a copy of the conviction in that case. Make sure it's a certified copy, and if you can't afford a certified copy or run out of time, bring the case number with you and ask the judge to take judicial notice of that conviction. After you are done presenting your evidence, the respondent will have an opportunity to call witnesses and present evidence to the judge. Sit quietly and try not to react if the respondent or the respondent's witness says something to upset you. You will have the chance to question them about their testimony once they finish. When the respondent or their witness is done testifying, you may ask them questions to clarify portions of their testimony or to point out weaknesses in their case. You can prepare questions to ask a witness beforehand, or you can jot down questions to ask them while they are testifying. If you do not like the answer they provide, you can ask a follow-up question, but do not argue with their answers. At the end of the hearing, the judge will make a decision based on the evidence that was presented. The judge will either allow you to keep your restraining order as it is, allow you to keep your restraining order with some changes, or dismiss your restraining order. If the judge allows you to keep your restraining order, you should keep a copy with you at all times so that if you have to call the police, they will know about your restraining order immediately. If the respondent violates your order, you may call the police to report the violation. The police must arrest the respondent if they believe your order was violated. You may also have to contact the district attorney's office to ask them to pursue charges for the violation. Even if you decide not to report a violation, you should still keep a record of all the times the respondent violates your order. If you would like more information about restraining orders in Oregon, you can go to our website, OregonLawHelp.org, for free legal information. You may also want to watch our other videos on restraining orders. If you would like to speak to an attorney, but you cannot afford one, you may be able to get free legal help from legal aid attorneys in Oregon. To find your local legal aid office, visit OregonLawHelp.org 
You can click on the Use This Map option on the right side of the website to find the office that serves your county. If you can afford to pay an attorney but do not know one, you can call the Oregon State Bar Lawyer Referral Service at 503-684-3763 or toll free at 1-800-452-7636. They can help you find an attorney that is familiar with your type of case.